everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for this week of June 2014. Uh, got a lot to talk about here, but before I get started, I need to say a few things. Uh, number one, uh, in case y'all don't follow me on social media, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr, um, I got a few things to say first. I need to say that I have unfortunately chosen to leave Dark Adventure Inc. Plus. I had just found I had found out probably a few days ago, right before I made the announcement on Facebook, that the uh, original Dark Avenger Inc. had apparently closed down months ago, and nobody bothered to tell me, which kind of upset me, and kind of I kind of felt a little insulted by that, but that nobody bothered to tell me, and if they did, they did a poor job in trying to and that hardly anybody was doing any videos for Dark Avenger Inc. Plus uh, I, either, so I decided why try to stay afloat on a sinking ship, I'm just going to go ahead and just jump right off and go on about my business. You know, I'm not trying to disrespect Dark Avenger Inc. or Inc. Plus or, or anything like that, but lack of communication is a real problem with me, and if you're not going to bother to tell me that, hey, we're probably going to wrap this up or go and do something else. If you're not going to bother to tell me, then it honestly tells me that you didn't really care. You just wanted some publicity. I understand that, and I I am grateful to Dark Adventure Inc. and Inc. Plus for allowing me to do videos for them, but the timing is right. I need to get away from it, and, and it was getting so much, much harder to find the time to do videos for them anyway. Uh, but, yeah, there's my thoughts on that um, as for the, the the titles that I reviewed for Dark Avenger Inc. Plus uh, which was Batman Eternal and Fantastic Four I need to get caught up on those series those reviews will be moved to my Blue Goblin X channel I will be doing them on there as well as uh, back issue reviews Rev uh, books that I had picked up but I didn't pick them up when they first came out, and I had to wait on it and everything like that. And I got two more coming up, and it's for All New X Factor and Amazing X-Men. I'll be reviewing those issues on my Blue Goblin X channel after I get done filming this review. So, there you go. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the reviews for this week. We're going to start with DC and end with Marvel. We're going to start DC off with Batgirl number 32. Get a good look at that. How well the light's gonna shine on it and everything like that, but yeah, this is the bombshell variant. I, I love this stuff. Uh, Gail Simone, once again, I tip my hat to you, dear lady. Uh, this was good. This was really good. I I like the attention to detail when you're trying to tell a bad girl story, but also remember that Barbara Gordon is a person, and I liked how Gail captured that in the writing of this issue not just in this issue but in previous issues late earlier on in this series that a lot of people need to remember Barbara is more than just Batgirl Barbara has her own life she's I like how Gail is focusing on both on both drama for both Barbara and Batgirl it's not just you know Batgirl and then Barbara trying to live a civilian life while trying to hide her drama of what's going on with her with Batgirl, there's also drama involving her as Barbara. You know, not you know to mention uh, her, I guess still her boyfriend Ricky's you know uh, up and coming lawsuit against her father James. Also, you got Batgirl's dilemma with Nightfall. Then you also got the awkwardly hilarious way of Barbara finding out about Alicia and her her new girlfriend. A very awkwardly funny scene involving the three of them it was just great it's nothing original but it was still funny I actually chuckled at it I'm just gonna go ahead and fly out say a Barbara walks in on them having sex of course you don't see anything about it but it's it's implied and it's just hilarious I, I laughed at it it was great that was probably the 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 only uplifting part of the book was getting a laugh out of that everything else is just heavy drama 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 a familiar face from Barbara's, from Barbara's past, not Batgirl's, Barbara's past, makes her way back into her life, and not in the best way, and it just pours more drama on Barbara's life, 
you know, and we find out this person has been following Barbara and keeping an eye out on her, knows everything about her job at the burger joint, knows about, you know, what's going on with her dad, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, Barbara, you know, she actually, this per, this old friend of hers actually stands saying, hey, we want you to join us. And Barbara just tells her to go to hell and she just goes on about her business. And then we find out what Nightfall has been doing and how Barbara finds out about that. It's just, woo! Just real heavy on the drama, and you know, she decides that she needs to get some help. So she turns to a very old friend, uh, an old friend that she feels that she can still trust. And then a third person gets involved in this. And I'm not going to ruin this, even though I'm sure everybody's blown up all about it all over the internet. But I still don't want to spoil it. The ending was really good. The drama was all here. The artwork helped tell this story that Gail is writing. The artwork was great. It was dark, yet not too dark and not too gritty. It really, the tone of the artwork and the way the coloring was done, it helped It helped keep the pacing of the story and it helped keep it in a good flow. I really liked it. This was good. It's not a five star perfect, but for what I got, I loved it. It's great. Gail, I love you. Keep writing your stuff like this. Just really good stuff. I give this a four. All right, moving on to Detective Comics number 32. Oh, God. Love me some Poison Ivy. Oh, toxic Kiss. Really gets your blood pumping. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this was... Um, don't worry, Poison Ivy's nowhere in here. This is just a cover. This is just a bombshell variant cover. It has nothing to do with Poison Ivy at all. This is the next part in the Icarus storyline. And like I said before with Bad Girl, the artwork does a really good job. It has kind of a, excuse the pun, a very artistic look to it. You know, the, the way the penciling is done and the way the coloring is done. Like that unique style of gritty grittiness and color coloristic blend that, that the story is being presented here and the writing is really good. I just like how the colors and the pencils blend together. It almost seems that like that's what it looks like and it really helps sell this story. And another key factor is that, you know, Harvey Bullock is dead set on proving that there's a connection between Icarus and Bruce Wayne because remember, this is this is a very personal case. To Harvey Bullock. This is not the first time he's had to deal with the Icarus stuff and of course Batman's trying to do all his detective skills as well and I love how they remember that Harvey is quite the detective himself. He is easily able to figure out that Batman is indeed maybe one step ahead of him as far as the investigation around this drug is concerned but it's very well told out. There's a really good scene between Batman and the um, and Elena's daughter. Elena being one of the victims that connects this story to Bruce Wayne. Uh, there's a really good scene between him, between him and her, uh, and her daughter. I thought it was really well done. I like. I think the stuff that she said was kind of heavy on the drama, on the melodramatic, and it was really, really, really well done. And it has the way this issue wraps up towards the cliffhanger. It's one of those old school scenarios where Batman's hot on the case, and at the end, at the cliffhanger at the end of the issue, you pretty much see that. Batman might be a bit, might be a bit fucked, but it's the the cliffhanger was nothing original, but it keeps me interested. This is definitely one of the stronger Batman titles out there, and I think that's kind of funny yet sad. We got the crap with Zero Year, but we got good stuff here in Detective. You know, it's just you know you got all kinds of Batman shit. You just take your pick and just roll with it. This was really good, strong issue. I'll give it a four. All right, moving on to Green Lantern Corps number 32, another bombshell variant cover. I, I just love these covers. They're damn cute. Arisia's Dog Walking Services. It is, this is just cute. Uh, Van Jensen and Bernard Chang, they do a great job. This is the next part of the Uprising story. And we find out quite a few things here. Uh, Sodom Yacht is back. That was the big thing in the last part. Sodom Yacht's return and his finally his arrival in the New 52. Uh, Sodom Yacht 
they him and a bunch of uh, him, John Stewart, and a bunch of other Green Lanterns go to their his home planet, and they find out that the Daxamites and Sodom Yacht, they their terms, uh, it's you know they're happy to see Sodom again, but you know it's like you can tell the Yacht is really conflicted on how he should feel right now and everything like that. We also find out some things about the Durlands and Von Daggle, the uh, the Durlin Green Lantern. He does something really ballsy in this issue. He does something that gives the Green Lanterns a a huge a huge helping hand. Doesn't give them an advantage, but it helps them out in a very big way. Got to give props to Von Daggle in here. I mean, ooh got balls man for what you did and it's really well respected very nicely done we're getting to see more of the Durlands plans unfolding and what exactly they're going after of course we've already got a pretty big pretty big clue as to what they're planning but we get to see more of it in great detail it's explained a little bit better than it was in the previous part of this story and I actually liked it this was really good solid not perfect but a great read, very entertaining, heavy on the, not too heavy on the action, but really good on the swerves and the twists, just a couple of what the hell kind of moments in here, and it's just really well told. The artwork in here was good, it wasn't dark, it was bright, it was colorful, uh, I wouldn't say cartoony, but it's, it's artwork that fits storytelling like this, intergalactic space cop storytelling and stuff like that. It's what you would come to expect for a good Green Lantern story. And this issue was no exception. This was a good read. I loved it. It was great. Like I said, not perfect. I give this a 3.5 out of 5. Moving on to Marvel. we got all new X-Men. Number 28. Brian Michael Bendis. Stuart Eimanen. Yeah, this was interesting okay this was interesting wait a minute I said 3.5 for Greenland I meant to give it a 4 excuse me I, I apologize I don't know what the fuck I was saying 3.5 for Greenland I give it a 4 excuse me I apologize I made a mistake I gave I'm getting I'm giving Greenland core 32 a 4 not a 3.5 fuck I I'm I, I goofed my bad all right getting back to um, all new X-Men 28 God, I fucked up real bad, but I got to keep going. Uh, like I said, this was interesting. This was really interesting. Uh, more time travel story. I mean, this is... God, how do I explain this? You know, it's one of those time travel stories where you see the people from the future and you also see them in the, pe in the past or, or their past, which is our present... Yet they're saying we get, we got messages from ourselves from the past. Here we are in the future, so we can go back to the present before we arrive. We can go back to the past before we arrive in the present to make sure we don't get our asses kicked. So we go back to go check out Jean Grey. If you could repeat any of that bullshit I just said, I'll give you a I'll give you a medal. But the thing is, it's just really weird, and it's just one of those complicated time travel storylines that. It's not perfect. I could understand where some people say it might suck, but then again, I could also understand where some people think it was entertaining as hell and they enjoyed it. It's one of those. It's one of those 50-50, you know, sit scenarios. You know, this is going to be one of those storylines for X Men where some people will love it and some people will hate it. I'm kind of in the middle. I like it, but then again, I'm not a real big fan of it because it gets really complicated on a few occasions. Like, for example, Xavier, in the Battle of the Atom storyline, didn't, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but didn't they say Xavier was Charles Xavier's grandson, and in here they're saying it's his son with Mystique? That's kind of a big change in character exposition that, they even explain in here, is like, you may have known my father or my father's father. I'm like, okay, what is he? Is he Charles Xavier's grandson or his son? I don't know, uh, but I will say this, Xavier from the Future Brotherhood is one cold-hearted bastard. I mean, this guy would make Magneto go, dude, what the f 
fuck is wrong with you? You know, it's like the stuff he does with Future Beast and all the other mutants and everything, how he's easily able to control them with just a mere thought, it's just like, woo! Why wasn't Xavier this much of a badass during Battle of the Atom? Would have made that story so much better than it was, in my opinion. But then we get to the big, the big, uh, the big uh, cliffhanger at the end of the issue that in concerns Xavier, but also concerns Jean Grey and something else. This is one of those rare occasions where you have two different ways of delivering the cliffhanger at the same time and it's got me interested in the next issue so much and it's really good the cliffhanger implies that xavier might be fucked both physically and mentally come next issue we get to see the physical threat to xavier but we don't see what the mental threat is going to be and i like that because gene proclaims that you don't fully know me you bastard and she's about to do something. We don't know what she's about to do, but we do see the physical threat to Xavier while he's in a limb, while he's in a mind fight with Young Gene. It's really, really well done. The cliffhanger was anyway. The rest of the stuff, take it or leave it for what you can say. You can say you love it, and you can say you hate it, and I can understand either argument. It's just one of those kinds of issues. I give this, I give this a three. Uh, it's really complicated yet interesting and entertaining at the same time with a great cliffhanger. There you go. <sighs> Moving on to The Amazing Spider-Man number 1.2. Dan Slott still doing a good job with the writing. It's not the best stuff in the world, but it's a great job. And I fucking love that cover. That cover is badass. I love it. It's artistic and very well detailed and very well designed. It's just really good. Now, I'm pretty sure there's already kinds of all kinds of people all over the internet saying that Peter kind of acts out of character a bit in this book, and I'm like, well, you gotta remember, this takes place in Spider-Man's infancy. This takes place during the events of issue two from the '60s during the Stanley Steve Ditko days. So remember, Spider-Man is still a really, really big rookie in the superhero business at this point in time in this particular run called learning to crawl so remember if you think that peter and spider-man are acting out of character you got to remember he's a rookie here so give him a little slack but you know we get to see not just peter and spider-man's turmoils in his rookie years but we also get to see that Poss they, they shoehorned in another angle with this other fanboy hero called Clash, who his powers are actually pretty cool. It, it kind of looks a little similar to another Spider-Man rogue. <coughs> Shocker. Oh, excuse me. I had a little something in my throat. But, um... It, yeah, Clash was trying to catch up to Spider-Man as he was leaving the Baxter building, as he was trying to apply for membership to the Fantastic Four way back in 1963's Amazing Spider-Man number two. And we also get to see Clash, he tries to chase down the Vulture, and he doesn't catch him. You know, he tries to set up a, a, a fake fight with Spider-Man to get publicity and get money and everything like that. And just, things ain't looking so good for Clash when he comes face to face with, face -to -face with his idol, Spider-Man. And we get that stock cliche re uh, uh, re revelation that you were you were never a hero. You're a fraud. You're a phony. It's been done a million times where a fanboy or a fangirl comes across their hero who they see as a god, and when they see how they act, when they act like a dick in front of them, they all of a sudden get this revelation that they're not a hero, they're just there for the publicity. They're just a hero for the money, for the fame, for the glory, and everything like that. I have seen this, seen this cliche a dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and God damn it, it's getting fucking old. Hell, it was even one of the, the developments that led to the birth of Venom, for Christ's sakes. And that was how long ago? And that shit was already getting pretty old back then, and here we are now doing that fucking shitty angle again. But, to be fair, 
it was well told the artwork was good with a kind of a retro sense to it I, I did like that this issue was not horrible it was good it's just uh, just some of the things kind of dragged it down for me but I did enjoy it for what it was it was above average but damn nowhere near perfect I mean seriously I give the I'm gonna, I'm gonna be nice and give this a three moving on to Nightcrawler number three Chris Claremont there you go enough said this book was good <laughs> but any no anyway Kurt um, is fighting this guy Trimega and we finally get an explanation as to why he's called Trimega interesting so Kurt his adopted mother and his first love go back to the Jean Grey school and this is where I have my big problem with this particular book Storm and it's not the first time she's came off like this and trust me I'll get to I'll get to that I'll get to that when I review Amazing X-Men but in here Storm just kinda came off as a bit a bit unforgiving and a bit paranoid for me I, I don't know maybe it's because of all the shit she's gone through her her marriage to Black Panther failed the whole AVX thing and all the, this shit between Scott and Logan and all this kinds of stuff I, you can I can understand Storm's really stressed and she's going under a lot of shit I get that but in this particular issue the way she talks to Kurt and the way she conducts herself she just comes off a, a little bit cold and a little bit unforgiving and a little bit on the paranoid side you know but it's understandable but still it kind of bothers me to see Storm like this because Storm's a better person than that in my opinion but um, this was really good uh, story flowed very well big swerve I mean a big swerve more than one actually more than one big swerve leading up to the cliffhanger of this book this was really good I love the scene between Kurt and Wolverine you put those two together in a panel if the writing is good I'm gonna fucking enjoy it for every word they give me this was good solid read a couple of things kind of dragged it down for me a bit but overall an enjoyable read I give it a three and a half out of five I don't want to do this because I got to admit that I made a mistake uncanny X-Men special number one this is part one of three no end in sight I'm gonna tell you all right now I don't give two fucks about part two and three because this issue is overpriced and underwhelming this book was bad I mean the only good thing about this issue is that it did show some focus on Racer X and him actually trying to teach these young mutants something rather than just send them off sending them off into random battles at random places where they just randomly get their asses kicked and just whistle for Meji to come by and just sweep them all up and just like act like nothing ever fucking happened but that was the only good thing for me about this book was seeing Scott or Dick Summers if I as I still want to call him He's actually trying to teach these kids something. I mean, actually teach them something. But also at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, why the fuck are you having flight lessons and flight simulation training done in an actual fucking airplane instead of doing it in a danger room as setting or setting up a computer program that actually is a flight simulator? What the fuck? And... I got, if I don't mention this, somebody's going to mention it in the comments. Uh, near the end of the book, yes, it's there. The amazing, <laughs> the amazing mutant power of growing a goatee in one panel. Uh, just ridiculous. And uh, the artwork was kind of cartoony. It just uh, hardly no thought dialogue boxes to tell out exposition no introductions of names and everything like that it just kind of fell bleh we don't get a definitive major villain for this storyline all we see is 
We get a tease of possibly who the main antagonist is, but it turns out the way his dialogue is done and how his character is presented in this issue kind of feels like he's nothing more than just a mere lackey he's just higher on the food chain than the mercenaries he sent down to go kidnap Racer X. It's just... Uh, this is just one of those books that's just simply there. I paid five bucks for this bullshit, and after reading this, I was... I was hoping and I was praying that Marvel would give me something, give me a $5 X-Men book that, uh, based off this team of mutants, based on this particular team of X-Men, and I was hoping it would be good, but wouldn't you know it, Marvel fucking disappointed me by giving me a $5 book that was less than average at best, with no real focus on a main antagonist, just fucking artistic flubs, fucking character flubs, all kinds of shit. This did nothing for me. I posted the free digital code for this on Tumblr. And hell, if you're the lucky one that found the code and was able to get it on your tablet or what the fuck ever, then good luck in trying to enjoy this because you probably will enjoy it better than I did. Or hell, you might hate it worse than I did. This book was shit. I give it a one. Well... That's all I got for this week, everybody. I want to thank you all for joining me. It's time for me to quit running my mouth and get on to some other reviews. Uh, before I go, I want to thank everybody at Dark Avenger Inc. and Inc. Plus for allowing me to do videos for them, even though they didn't politely tell me that they were they, they were stopping it. But I am grateful for allowing me, for them allowing me to do reviews for them. I also want to extend my my uh, uh, my bro fist of respect to Mark at uh, Fat Stack of Comics. Uh, apparently, uh, it's not my business, but apparently Fat Stack of Comics is on hiatus for now, so I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, once again, big shout out to my bro, the Mount Vernon Kid, Deadpool Zilla, and Brandon Hex. Hex, man, your classic X-Men video tributes are good. They're a little long, but they're good. I'm enjoying them. And of course, Deadpool Zilla is just knocking out of the park with his Godzilla stuff. He's a Godzilla fanboy, and I like that. Uh, and also to my girlfriend Jennifer, I love you, baby. We gotta find something to do for Arkham Asylum Studios. That channel is not dead. It's not going away. We just gotta find something silly and stupid to review on it. There you go. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. And until next time, I'll see y'all later.